Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And I'm Meher Roy. Today we are joined by two, a pair of talented developers from Argentina. They have worked on many projects. Uh, some of them are quite well known in the Bitcoin industry. These projects are Proof of Existence, uh, Streamium, uh, Faradam, and Decentraland. We are going to talk about uh, their projects and the prospects of Bitcoin in Argentina. Uh, to introduce our guests, they are Manuel Arauz and uh, Esteban Ordano. We are, we are very ha happy to have you on the show, Manuel and Esteban. Hey, Mer. Thanks for having us. We're glad to be here. Hi. Hi. Thanks a lot for having us here. Okay. So, so perhaps we could start with uh, Bitcoin in Argentina. Because uh, uh, there's this impression in the in the Bitcoin media that Argentina is the one country which could adopt Bitcoin and and jumpstart uh, jumpstart Bitcoin and leapfrog ahead of all the other nations in in this technology. What's your opinion on that? Yeah, it, it's actually pretty funny to us to read all those articles uh, claiming Argentina is like the center for Bitcoin and where Bitcoin is growing faster than. It's actually not quite true. Um, as, I, I, as I always tell everyone, uh, Argentina is kind of a, a, good, a good spot in, in many ways for Bitcoin because our local currency is really, really bad and there are big capital controls and it's hard to get foreign currencies. But actually adoption is, is pretty slow and I, I would say Bitcoin is, is growing much faster and adoption is much wider in, in other countries. So. I wouldn't say Argentina is the, the best place for Bitcoin right now. It's, and it's actually, I, I read many things in news articles that are totally not true about Argentina and Bitcoin. So be careful about that. <laughs> but at the same time, the development scene in Argentina is quite good. There are many companies and cool projects that are springing from Argentina. So that kind of counterbalances the low usage of Bitcoin in general. And uh, how, I mean, I think one thing that has been pretty consistent is the Argentinian government's attempts to sort of stop Bitcoin from pr proliferating in Argentina, regardless of whether or not it's being used. Uh, how are those startups uh, 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 coping with that? Yeah, actually, the, the Argentinian government is not, is not a, actively working against Bitcoin. I wouldn't say that. There was uh, uh, the, the only official uh, communication or, or action about Bitcoin was uh, um, a posting by the central bank warning the, the population about Bitcoin not being minted by the, by the government, like saying, OK, be careful with this because we don't uh, regulate Bitcoin. We don't regulate its emission. So be careful. And that's about it. As far as I know, I'm not a legal expert, but uh, it's it's actually a, a more or less friendly environment for Bitcoin companies in Argentina. So we've been duped by all those CoinDesk articles <laughs> telling us that uh, <laughs> you know, Argentina is like... Yeah, sure. So Streamium is a live streaming application that uses Bitcoin payment channels as a monetization um, option. So it started off as a, a, as a hackathon project between uh, uh, seven friends. It's actually, the team is quite big. Uh, we, we, it, it was a group that we used to get together uh, in, during the weekends for, we call them Bitcoin dinners. We got together and talked about latest news uh, about Bitcoin, what we saw about the future. And after a while, we got bored about just talking because most of us are developers or uh, work with technology, so uh, we wanted to actually do something. One of the guys suggested doing a, a hackathon, so we got together on a weekend and started. It, it was actually Esteban's idea to build Streamium. Uh, we, we were talking a lot about payment channels, and we wanted to build a, an application that was interesting uh, in, in the sense that it showed the real value of payment channels as a protocol. Uh, so we, we built it over uh, a couple of weekends and we launched it several months later because it was a super slow development in our free time. 
but that's that's a story so, <laughs> so what it basically does is uh, uh, it allows a user to to record something and stream it live uh, and stream it live and in exchange receive payments through through bitcoin uh, bitcoin micro uh, payment channels so uh, maybe we could discuss part of the architecture of uh, of of streamium uh, and there are two important sections to it one is how does the money flow and the second is how does the data flow and could you explain how both of these things happen when i create my own streamium stream yes of course um so streamium uses webrtc uh, which is a decentralized peer to peer protocol so can, browsers can talk to each other we are currently relying on a, a rendezvous server so that uh, browsers can create the connections uh, between each other and with that webrtc connection you, you can send both the data and the video uh, we're using the capability of sending data so they can negotiate a bitcoin payment channel and this is uh, an uh, actually i think it's the first implementation of a payment channel for some kind of like real world usage um, uh, once that payment channel is established the video streaming uh, starts uh, and it's a broadcasting uh, mechanism so uh, if i'm broadcasting my video uh, everybody that is receiving the video will have to be paying me through a payment channel so from a from a technical standpoint uh, it's a well it's not fully fully decentralized we have i, I will say the the gotchas in a second but uh, both the video it goes through a peer to peer protocol and the and the payments because payments grow through bitcoin payment channels which we all know is a decentralized payment system and the video goes through webrtc which is a peer to peer protocol for the browser and the the two the two uh, points of centralization are what Esteban mentioned, the, the rendezvous server where peers can uh, get uh, the other peers' information for, for discovery. And of course, the, the static uh, HTML server that uh, serves the files for the client to run the, the application. OK, so could you describe the, the payment channels and how they work in more detail? So a payment channel is kind of like uh, opening a tab in a bar. Uh, you set a certain amount of money that it's the maximum that you want to spend in that payment channel and you lock those funds in a two of two address. Um, so this two of two is controlled by both parties in the payment channel. So any transaction that gets signed uh, will have to have the approval of both parties. And there's a time lock mechanism in, uh, in case I funded this payment channel, but the other party uh, that is going to be receiving the funds uh, will not uh, be willing to uh, sign a transaction giving back all the funds. So after a day, you can recover all your bitcoins. Is that clear enough? Or? Yeah, but so in, so if I understand those th in this case what you're doing is you're doing a, a two of two trans, a multi signature transaction the um, the person that's doing the streaming will have incentive to to sign that but so for the for the viewer so the what viewer is forces the, him is to the sign? one the viewer is the one that will fund the channel uh, we we usually call them technically the consumer and the provider of the service so the consumer funds the channel and asks the provider for a signed transaction that becomes valid the next day so he can have the fund, funds back if the protocol gets interrupted. Interrupted. Okay, so once the stream is, inis is initiated, the consumer has already signed his part of the transaction and is waiting for the provider to sign his part of the transaction. Yes, he actually does this. Uh, he signs a transaction and he waits for the provider to sign a transaction, a second transaction, spending that first two of two, pay, paying to, to, uh, to a two of two address 
transaction. It's kind of like complicated. I would need a blackboard to explain it. Sorry. Well, that's okay because this is a podcast, so people don't necessarily see. If they're not watching the video, they're not going to see it anyway. But um, and so the, the the payment channel is opened, and then uh, so there's a payment for every chunk of let's say thirty seconds of video. How does that work? How do you how does the money keep flowing? All right. So as uh, sending an update of the payment channel, which means uh, spending a little bit more money from those locked funds. Um, when, when I send one of these small micropayments to the provider of the service, he will send me uh, back the video. Right now in Streamium, what we are using is uh, we interrupt the video if the payment flow stops coming. And if the video stops coming, uh, we interrupt the payment flow. So it's a trustless solution for payments. So, so basically, um, could we say it like this? Suppose it's me, uh, me, the creator of the video, and Esteban is the consumer. I'm the producer, and Esteban is the consumer. Then what is happening is uh, when I start my stream, um, nothing happens. Now, when you want to, when you want to, when you want to see my stream then you will send your bitcoins into a multi-signature address that is controlled by you and me jointly, right? Yes. And so now, so, so basically when the service started, you agreed to watch the service for a maximum of one hour. And then let's say the price of that one hour is $50 an hour. So you locked $50 worth of bitcoin into a, into a, into an address which is jointly controlled by you and me. Now, now what now what starts to happen is there has to be data that needs to go from my webcam because I'm the producer to your uh, your terminal. So, with each item of data, let's say like the, there's a there's a there's a big packet that that has 30 30 seconds of video. So, corresponding to the transfer of that item that packet of data from my computer to yours, you need to send me a, a transaction which allows me to claim part of the funds that were locked into the multi-signature account, right? Yeah, that's, uh, that's correct. And okay. uh, we, it doesn't have to be 30 seconds. Uh, it can be one second, it could be one minute. Uh, and uh, you may want to be sure that you have a certain margin of error so you don't stop the video because you didn't receive the payment. So it's actually more like a flow of video from one, in, one connect, in one way and a flow of payment in the other way. Okay, so the question I, I start to have here is, let's say, let's say I, am, I am creating a stream and uh, I have already, uh, created this multi-signature account with Esteban because Esteban is watching my stream. Now Manuel joins, Manuel wants to see my stream so I create another account with Manuel and then Sebastian wants to join, there's a third one created. Is it the case that I'm broadcasting my video data to all three of you through WebRTC? Wouldn't that need a lot of bandwidth on my side? Yes, uh, you are constrained by the amount of bandwidth that your upstream connection has. Uh, so if you want to have uh, many users, let's say, I guess that more than 10 will start to really uh, stress the connection. Um, you may want to uh, look into another, a different solution, some kind of like first uh, cast to a server that will then broadcast the video to a lot of users or maybe use a more decentralized solution like BitTorrent for the distribution of the video, right? Let's take a short break to talk about our brand new sponsors, Hide.me. I've uh, personally been using them for about a year, so I'm really excited to have them on. You know, you know we sometimes take our, our, our privacy and security online for granted. I know that I did. I often tell people, if you use public Wi-Fi, 
uh, you might as well assume that your data has been compromised in some way. There's so many ways people can attack you nowadays. I mean, if you're using a website that isn't SSL, people can, on the same network as you, can pretty much see anything that you're doing on that website. And even SSL websites, uh, like your bank, social media, or Bitcoin wallets, for example, can be vulnerable to certain types of attacks. Uh, so, you know, as a Bitcoin user, in your office or in a co-working space, or like if you're in a public Wi-Fi, someone could potentially target you just based specifically on the websites that you visit. Uh, now you wanna protect yourself against that. And to do that, you need Hide.me. Hide.me gives you an encrypted connection between your device and their network of servers. So attackers and even your ISP have no idea what you're doing. This all happens over super fast gigabit ethernet, so there's no lags, and you have an encrypted tunnel there, uh, which protects you. And in addition to that, Hide.me keeps no logs of any of your activity. And the great thing about Hide.me is that they have a free plan. The free plan gives you up to two gigabytes of data per month at unthrottled bandwidth. And that's just enough so you can protect yourself whenever you use a cafe, when you're traveling, you're on an airplane, in an airport, uh, or use any public Wi-Fi spot. And you can sign up and get that free account when you go to Hide.me slash Epicenter. The great thing too is that if you ever decide later to get a premium account, then signing up with that URL is going to get you 35% off. The premium account includes unlimited bandwidth access to all their servers worldwide and they've got lots of them. And it also lets you connect up to five devices simultaneously. You use it on your mobile phone and with all your devices. And of course, you can pay with Bitcoin. Now we'd like to welcome Hide.me as a new sponsor. We're excited about what they're doing. And of course, we would like to thank them for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. So um, I guess this is sort of a structural problem with WebRTC is that it's, it's a peer-to-peer -peer only um, protocol. Now, you mentioned BitTorrent. That's interesting because we had thought of, uh, about you know, different ways that you could um, scale WebRTC, and I guess this would not only apply to what you're doing in sort of the you know Bitcoin micropayments space, but also could be potentially used for you know large scale WebRTC broadcasts um, by just about anyone. Uh, is by using BitTorrent or perhaps IPFS or some other distributed file sharing protocol to stream video. Has that, does that already exist? Has that been done before? Or is this something that you're looking into for Streamium? Well, actually, one of the other Streamium developers, his name is Shemel, he did a small experiment about that. Uh, we, we had the same idea, and he, he wanted to test it out. And it actually worked pretty well, but, well, not, not pretty well. It, it could work, but it was hard to make it uh, perform well, uh, talking about video, live video quality. So there, there are some complications where you're dealing with uh, a live stream of video. And we were having, like, because uh, torrents are predetermined size files because you need to check the file integrity. And, and it has, it, it's, not, it's not designed to, to stream files. So you have some problems when you are connecting several chunks of, of video. And it's also, um, as Esteban pointed out, uh, in, in live streaming, you can drop some frames and it's fine. But the BitTorrent protocol uh, doesn't support that kind of stuff. You need to download the whole file. So we, we had some pretty successful experiments with that. But uh, there's still a lot of work to be done to optimize the protocol and, and allow other ways to distribute the, the video without relying on, on the provider to, to share the same video to everyone. And is, I mean, is this something that has been addressed? Like, I mean, the, 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 the problem of streaming live video to a large audience uh, w without having to rely on some centralized uh, third party like Ustream or something like that. Is this something that has been addressed or perhaps we have actual solutions for uh, sort of outside of what you guys are doing? Uh, not that I'm aware of. But it would be interesting to see if there's a distributed peer-to-peer -peer version of the real-time protocol, which is what WebRTC and uh, Skype or all those solutions use. It's either 
RTP or uh, XH263 or 363 or something. I don't remember the name. It, it would be a really cool experiment to build something on that. Well, I mean, if you guys successfully do this with BitTorrent, I, you know, you'd essentially be the first to, to achieve that, right? Yeah, we, we actually don't know if there's another project doing something similar. Uh, we should look it out. But uh, as I told you, it, was, it's what, it, it worked like as a proof of concept, but it, it still needs a lot of work to actually work uh, uh, correctly. It, you, we would need to polish the protocol in many ways. And I don't think the best solution is to use BitTorrent based on the, the things I mentioned earlier. But maybe building a, a specific protocol for this could work. Another question is, doesn't the, doesn't the fact that Bitcoin need confirmations uh, to confirm a Bitcoin transaction, one needs one hour, and uh, zero confirmation transactions are, um, are not secure, doesn't it impede, impede Streamium in any way? Like, for example, if, I, if me and Esteban want to launch this stream, then Esteban's money needs to be locked in this two of two multi-signature account. And the process of that locking to be secure needs one hour. So how, how does it work out? What if I try to double spend you? So <laughs> right now, Streamium uh, uses zero confirmations by Block Cipher, and we are using the um, confidence in transaction uh, parameter from them. Because uh, the thread model is quite uh, quite uh, low on restrictions. Um, if like the worst thing that could happen for you is that I can watch a few seconds of video from you uh, because the streaming right now when that it detects a double spend, uh, it will cut the channel off. Uh, so you you could be. Uh, stolen of a few seconds of content from me, but that's kind of like the worst that could happen. Uh, okay. Streaming on your side will take care of that, and if the transaction gets confirmed, then it will stop checking for double spends or stuff like that. Okay, so so basically what you're saying is that um, when, when I'm trying to create this stream, uh, there is a risk of double spends, but the value at risk is very low. So, right. for example, if I'm if I'm taking if if I'm charging ten dollars an hour for a stream, and uh, you do a double spend, maybe it's the case that you saw two point five dollars worth of video and uh, and I didn't get paid for it. Yeah, if exactly. You managed to successfully double double spend. And probably even less because uh, right now Block Cipher, uh, the moment it detects in any uh, any transaction anywhere, uh, it will. Uh, report that and streaming on your side will say no hey this guy is trying to make a double spend so let's stop the video right now today's magic word is stream so what is the monetization model for a for a service such as for, for a service such as streamium are you looking to monetize it in any way yeah so streamium is a is an open source and free project uh, anyone can use it for free there's no charge I mean, the, the streamer charges the, their audience, but uh, to use the, the product is completely free. There's no fees. Uh, we're, not plan we're not planning to, to monetize, the, monetize it in any way. Uh, we had some ideas of doing a, like a, a separate service that allows uh, streamers to increase their, their potential audience based on the scalability problems we already discussed given that it's completely peer-to-peer -peer and the, the limit uh, is based on the, uh, on, on the streamer's bandwidth. Um, we were thinking about building a service that uh, broadcasters could connect to for a fee, uh, distribute, it, dis it could distribute the, the video for them. So still using WebRTC, but with an intermediary for video distribution. Uh, but we, we haven't... Uh, completed that. I mean, we haven't moved forward with that. It's an idea. It's, it's there in case we want to pursue monetization of streaming. So then the, the, the content producers get 100% of the money that, uh, that they charge for the video. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's really cool. 
so I mean, this is another, so we had another question regarding piracy. Um, what prevents someone from rebroadcasting a stream that they're paying for on for free or for for cheaper than what they're paying for it? Basically, yeah, no, yeah. nothing. I nothing. think <laughs> uh, information wants to be free. Uh, the moment that you give out information, uh, the people that received it is free to rebroadcast it. I think that uh, what weights in favor of the content producer is that probably the quality of the rebroadcast will be lesser because of uh, the video streaming. It kind of like loses some quality. It's important to, to note that uh, we're not trying to solve uh, piracy with uh, with streaming. It's just a way to monetize live content you create uh, for free. But of course, once uh, the the viewer gets the video on their machines, they can rebroadcast it in any way they they want. They already have like the like, like any content essentially. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, well then, I mean, my my uh, my next question is uh, on on use cases. So, um, you know, there's so many ways to do streaming video these days. Uh, we're using Google Hangouts right now. Um, of course, that doesn't provide monetization, but you know, some other solutions do. I believe YouTube is now starting to do uh, uh, monetization in their streams and there's other services that allow that. Uh, what differentiates a streamium user from a uh, YouTube paid live streams? I don't know what they call it, but uh, you know, from centralized services. What types of people do you see using streamium as opposed to other types of streaming services? Uh, it's kind of funny, but uh, we we have like fifty percent of the, our users are basically porn, so it's. Uh, girls come girls doing shows online for their clients i guess um, the the other use, big use cases are uh, education and live gaming so it's people doing online classes or sh showing their their screens while they play video games but the biggest one by far is porn uh, we think that it's probably based on the advantages uh, you have with bitcoin where you you don't have the the so-called. Uh, we learned about this after launching Streamium. It's it's something we don't know about. But uh, in in uh, live uh, porn, like live camera porn, there's the problem of uh, what they call the wife chargeback, where uh, it's it, they have a really high rate of chargeback, and it's not based on the the actual user. But when the wife sees, oh, what is this? And he says, no, I don't know. I I didn't. Use that. Okay, let's do a chargeback, uh, and that's a big problem apparently. And this sort of solves that, uh, but it also allows the the user to sort of end the stream at any point in time, so you don't have to prepay for something you want to watch, and it's sort of a win-win uh, in both sides. That's our our analysis of why this is uh, interesting for the porn use case. But so there's the privacy and anonymity part on the client side, and I suppose on the provider side is more money in the girl's pocket and yeah. not having to subject to you know like the, the rules and restrictions of some campsite. Um, yeah, essentially the the people using it are completely independent. Yeah, and apparently the the fees those sites charge for the the girls or the well the video producers. Uh, is really really high. Like, I I don't remember exactly the numbers, but I heard something like forty or fifty percent. So it's mad. So on the other types of people using it, well, you mentioned education and online gaming. Are you talking about uh, sort of Twitch style uh, people streaming their online gaming? Exactly. So uh, in education, we have several uh, language classes, like English or Spanish teachers, and uh, some a, a small amount of users doing consulting, um, and on the gaming side, it's mainly just people playing uh, video games and streaming their their screens while they play. And that's that's a feature we added 
some weeks after we launched Streamium, the possibility to broadcast your own screen because uh, some people, some users requested that, so we added. So, uh, like, I mean, obviously, like with with everything Bitcoin, all the technologies are in this super early phase, and uh, somehow uh, it also resembles the the Internet of old, in which uh, pornography was the first killer application. So maybe it's it's fitting that even for Bitcoin, this should be one of the one of the first. I I had this imagination that uh, maybe one day uh, drones could stream. Like I have this I have this like four hundred dollar parrot bipop drone that uh, you can fly around, and even though it's moving in the air, the video quality is extremely still. Like it 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 it, it, it seems like it's it's a tripod flying in the air. And I was I had this imagination that perhaps in the future I'll go to a concert from Pantera or some band or Bono and there'll be drones flying around and I can actually uh check out and, and they'll they'll be using something like Streamium to send out their video and I can actually take any of this stream and see what the drone is seeing basically. So uh so me, I mean like I, I had the feeling that it's uh, it's an idea that has a lot of uh lot of users in the future and maybe it, it needs just bitcoin to catch on in uh, in order to be be really used be, re, be really widespread it was interesting also to 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 see like uh, you you mentioned that you have this service that just does micro payments could you could you tell us what that is yes um based on uh, what we talked with our early users mainly the on the education side most were requesting some features we were not ready to develop, like, okay, we need a digital whiteboard where we can sort of write stuff and the student can watch that, or we need a dual video communication so that the, the viewer can also send their, their webcam content. And we, we said, okay, do we want to really build a, an education product? Uh, but because what they, we, based on what we talked with them, what they really valued was the the fact that they could charge by the second they were doing the class because sometimes they have problems charging after the class ends. So you, you do a two hour class and then the student disappears and they never pay. And so it's hard to get the money. The, the money is a, a problem in, in online teaching. And so when do you charge? Before the class, after the class? So they solved this. And we thought that maybe extracting the, the payment system from Streamium and doing a, a, a super simple app where you can use payment channels inside of any other application could be interesting. So we did that. We built Faradam. Uh, it's uh, just a, a, a good way to describe it is Streamium without the video. So we, you have a, you create a, a, a session. It's like a timer where you create a, a timer. You set your hourly rate or your rate per minute. And then you can connect a client and charge them uh, by the second. Uh, and you can use it uh, combined with any other application like Skype or whatever. It could actually be ch a chat session or, or whatever you want and charge, by, charge for your time to your clients. So which, ge which gets the higher number of users? Is it Streamium or is it, um, is it Faradam? So as I understand it, it's... Streamium is Faradam plus uh, plus the plus the software to do live video streaming. So which one is proving more popular? Yeah, actually Faradam was a pretty unsuccessful experiment. Uh, we had really few users. Uh, it was basically the the users that requested that functionality that used it a couple of times, but then we didn't see any actual growth, even though we tried to make it grow in some in some ways. Uh, so it's definitely Streamium is way more popular, and we have more users there. I mean, it it, it seems kind of obvious since you know Streamium is sort of a more of a final product, where Faradam, I mean, you sort of have to make it, uh, you you have to you have to come up with the the means to provide the service uh, which you're charging for. So. Um, and of course, you have all that porn on Streamium, and that, we all know that brings in a bunch of people, right? <laughs> I wanted to talk about uh, alternative funding models. 
I mean, micropayments have sort of been touted by the Bitcoin community as you know, one of the killer apps, and Bitcoin has often been described uh, in in some sense as a way to solve the content monetization problem uh, that we have. I mean, I mean, we've definitely uh, it's it's been something that we've thought a lot about. You know, how do we monetize our content? I think a lot of content producers all also ask themselves that question. Uh, there's different ways to monetize your content. You can sell advertising as we do. Uh, you can have a paywall. You can charge by the article, um, which is mostly like pay-per-view. And for the most part, advertising has won uh, pretty much uh, for every type of content that you don't literally pay for with money. Um, now, with regards to Bitcoin and, and, and microtransactions and how you would pay for content, I mean, it seems promising. It seems interesting as, an, as a thought experiment that, you know, you would go on some website and you would come up to an article and it would tell you, okay, you want to pay for this? And you just say yes, or a YouTube video, uh, or perhaps a stream. But in reality, I'm not sure that people are ready to do that for one, um, you need to have people using Bitcoin in this particular example. And two, people are so used to, you know, not paying for content directly that in order for that, uh, uh, for that behavior to change, you would need a whole lot of sort of pressure, I guess, um, from the content industry. I'd like to know what your thoughts are on this. Where do you see micropayments going in the future? I have some thoughts, but I think I'm talking too much. I want to know if Esteban has some comments there first. <laughs> well, uh, one of the biggest issues that we've seen with uh, user-facing micropayments is the, the mental cost of those transactions. Uh, you don't want to be browsing around and at the end of the day, knowing that you lost $10, $20 in some random website. But at the same time, you don't want to be uh, agreeing to be paying one cent per each article that you're reading. So it's kind of like an unsolved problem from a usability point of view. But at the same time, it's probably going to be most used in machine-to-machine the, uh, this aspect of micropayments. Although right now the best uh, solution that we've seen for content monetization is this one of uh, recording every website that you've been to and at the end of the day uh, pay out uh, accordingly to each, each one uh, website that you've seen uh, based on how much time you spend on it or how much you like it, it or how many, which ones you like the, the most uh, as a donation essentially yeah something like that with right now I think it's the best uh, kind of like solution I don't know what Manuel uh, that's one of the things that we were discussing with Manuel yeah I agree it's a it's a really hard problem like there's many many, many companies and many smart people working on this because we, we all see, we all have the intuition that there's some way of using Bitcoin micropayments to uh, sort of change the way content is, mon- is monetized on the web or in general in online. But it's a really hard problem. We, we need to work on the really small details of the user experience. Uh, there's a really great article by Nick Savo talking about the, the mental transaction costs of micropayments and how smart contracts can help with that. I recommend reading that if you're interested in the topic. But it's, it's actually, a, a, it will be a really uh, long uh, work of trying to figure out what the user interface is. In the case of uh, human level uh, micropayments for content, I agree with Esteban that we'll probably see uh, other applications where there, there are no humans involved uh, and their micropayments make uh, much more sense because essentially what micropayments and smart contracts solve is the problem of trust between the parties. Uh, they reduce the, the trust between the two parties for a, an economic interaction. 
And in the case of computers, I mean, in the case of humans, the trust is uh, usually there. Uh, so it's, it's really in the details where you can improve the experience with micropayments. Uh, but when you have two machines interacting, uh, it's, it's really machines cannot trust other machines because they can break or they have, I don't know, the concept of, of trust is really human. And uh, it makes a lot of sense to try and build some applications of micropayments with machine-to-machine uh, -machine interaction. Uh, there's one interesting example of an attempt to try to solve this the content monetization problem or to at least reduce the number of ads that we see is perhaps you've seen a Google contributor. So basically what Google has done is said to their users, uh, I mean, to everyone who uses the internet and sees uh, Google uh, advertising. So whenever you go on a website, for instance, and you see an ad, there's a pretty good chance that that ad was sold through Google and the content producer is making money when you see that ad and when you click it. And what Google has done is they said, okay, well, we're going to put up this platform called Google Cont Contributor. And as a user of the internet, you can pay upfront, say two, five, ten, twenty dollars $20 per month to not see ads. And rather than uh, paying the content producers through the display of ads, you're going to pay the content producer directly through, uh, through Google contributor. And we, you know, we will give them the money basically as though you were seeing an ad instead, you'll just see a white box or, I mean, you can put custom HTML in there or whatever. Um, so I thought that was really an, an interesting experiment, but you know, Google is in a particularly good position to do that because they own the advertising space. That's part of, of, the, the problem with these kinds of solutions too. It's hard uh, to solve the distribution uh, of, of a micropayment solution uh, for content monetization because uh, when you don't have any sites that support this, uh, you have no reason for users to uh, have the, the client side of the application. And if you have no users that can pay for, that can pay for these micro interactions, uh, the sites don't have any reason to implement the system too. So it's also a, a business or sort of growth hacking uh, problem where someone needs to figure out a way to to make the uh, this grow uh, in some way to solve the chicken and egg problem, so to speak. <laughs> it's time for a word from our sponsors, Voltoro.com, the gold to Bitcoin exchange. Look, if you've ever traded gold with fiat, you know how much of a hassle that can be. Of course, trading gold with Bitcoin makes it super easy and super fast to uh, send money into the exchange. And uh, with Volturo, you can start trading gold as little as one milligram and their trading fees start at 0.2%. And with the leading, the world leading security and transparency that Volturo are providing, you can rest assured that your Bitcoins are safe. And by the way, because you're trading commodities, you don't need to provide any KYC documentations for deposits less than $5,000 worth of Bitcoins per day, which means that there's barely any, there are no barriers to entry. You can get started today. You might be asking yourself, what do those guys do all day? Do they lie in their bathtub swimming gold? Well, you might think that, but actually they may be, may be doing that part of the time, but the other part of the time, they keep doing the same thing over and over again, and that's improving Voltoro. And they've done it again. So this time they've added instant confirmations. They've partnered with BlockCypher, and you can now deposit your Bitcoins and start trading straight away. So. Keep improving your service. Uh, so go to Voltoro.com and start trading gold today. We would like to thank Voltoro for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. So uh, you've mentioned that uh, the mental cost of transactions is uh, a barrier to micropayments. And on this front, I think Streamium has uh, innovated quite a bit. Like um, um, all the user sees is how much somebody charges per hour. And then the system works and you just decide whether you want to give something $50 an hour and then you watch the stream and you close out and everything else is handled on its own. The user doesn't really see the meter running, for example. Uh, have you, what kind of user feedback have you received regarding, uh, regarding this aspect? Are, are users happy with this kind of system or do you think uh, something else is needed, something even better is needed? Well, right now, the highest barrier 
for using payment channels is uh, the knowledge of that you are sending this transaction with a for the maximum amount of time that you will be watching and that kind of like confuses the users because well i have i've already tried to explain the payment channel but it, it's a complicated thing to do with the streaming uh, we're having that uh, maximum amount of money to be locked in uh, thing which is uh, the current biggest problem for payment channels for users uh, because the fact that the users need to lock funds and there are currently no wallets supporting payment channels uh, natively we need to ask them to make a sort of deposit then we create the payment channel and even though it's trustless we require the user to send the, the actual total amount, so it feels like, okay, am I prepaying this or not? Uh, so a, a big barrier to that is um, actual wallet adoption of the payment channels protocol. That would decrease the, the, the mental costs a lot, I think. But with regards to the metered payment, we actually uh, asked this question because we were afraid of the same thing about users being, I don't know, nervous about the costs, not knowing how much they're actually paying. But from what we interviewed, uh, all of them were said that it, it was OK. Like they, they understood it, and they were not nervous. They were not checking the time to see if, if they were wasting a lot of money or not. It was, I think we did a pretty good job, but we're still, we're still really far from an optimal solution, I think. Yeah, I, I, I used your service. And in the beginning, I. I saw this multi-signature address and the first thing I, I thought was uh, it's a centralized service that I'm sending money to you and you will partition the money between me and the and the stream creator. But then that turned out to be turned out to be wrong. It's actually a wallet in a browser that we had to code so we can have the payment channel. Español, English, Deutsch. Normalmente produzco solo videos en inglés y español. Normally I produce only videos in English and Spanish. Normalerweise produciré ich nur videos en English and Spanish. Pero hoy voy a hacer otra excepción y traducirlo también en alemán. But today I make another exception and translate it into German too. Aber heute werde ich noch mal eine Ausnahme machen und es auch in Deutsch übersetzen. Ja, algunas semanas tengo escrito en mi lista de tareas por hacer de traducir el video hashtag BTC4. Now, already some weeks ago, I have written on my to-do list to translate the video BTC4, hashtag BTC4. Schon seit ein paar Wochen habe ich uh, auf meiner to-do list geschrieben, um, den Video BTC4 in Deutsch zu übersetzen. Estoy segura que esta idea puede ayudar a mucha gente económicamente. I'm sure that this can help many people economically. Ich bin sicher, dass diese Idee vielen Leuten uh, finanziell helfen kann. Y da motivación para aprender Bitcoin and give motivation to learn about Bitcoin. Und Motivation geben, um über Bitcoin zu lernen. 
en este momento el precio de Bitcoin es muy bajo económico. At the moment the price of Bitcoin is very low economic. Im Moment ist der Preis von Bitcoin sehr tief. Sería el momento ideal para invertir. Hoy es el 15 de abril 2015. Would be the ideal moment to invest. Today is April 15th, 2015. Es wäre der ideale Moment zu investieren. Heute ist der 15. April 2015. El 27 de marzo 2015 he publicado en mi canal de YouTube Vanos Enigma el primer video sobre hashtag BTC4 explicando cómo me vino esta idea. On March 27th of 2015, um, I published my for the first video about hashtag BTC4 in my channel YouTube Vanos Enigma, explaining how I got the idea. Am 27. März 2015 habe ich in meinem YouTube-Channel Vanos Enigma den ersten, den ersten Video über Hashtag BTC4 veröffentlicht und äh, erzählt, erklärt, wie ich diese Idee bekommen habe. La idea consiste principalmente en lo siguiente. The idea mainly consists in the following. Die idea besteht hauptsächlich en folgenden, folgendem. Imprimir en direcciones de Bitcoin en papel. Diez o mínimo diez o mejor cien. To print Bitcoin directions in paper, at least 10 or better 100. Bitcoin adressen in Papier ausdrucken, um, minimum 10 or besser gleich 100. Y luego poner en cada dirección de Bitcoin una pequeña cantidad de Bitcoin. And then put in every Bitcoin direction a little amount of Bitcoin. Und dann in jede Bitcoin Adresse eine kleine Summe von Bitcoin transferieren. Y la próxima vez, cuando otra vez ves una persona por la calle pidiendo dinero, and the next time uh, you see again a person begging for money on the street. Und das nächste Mal, wenn du wieder eine Person auf der Straße betteln siehst. Y para tus amigos y amigas. And for your friends, of course. Und für deine Freunde natürlich. O tal vez eh, de propina en un restaurante. Or maybe a tip in a restaurant. Oder trinkgeld im restaurant. Bueno, a la hora de imprimir también copiar y guardar las llaves privadas de Bitcoin. De direcciones de Bitcoin. Or when you print the Bitcoin addresses, um, copy and save the private keys of the Bitcoin addresses, of course. Wenn man die Bitcoin-Adressen druckt, auch die uh, 
auch die privaten Schlüssel, Bitcoin Address Schlüsseln ähm, kopieren und speichern. Die Alaora de distribuir las direcciones de Bitcoin, escribir la fecha, por ejemplo, hoy es el 15 de abril 2015, escribir la fecha más plus cuatro años, eh, igual 15 de abril 2019. And then in the moment when you distribute uh, the Bitcoin addresses, you write the date, for example, today, April 15th, 2015, plus, plus four years uh, is April 15th, 2019. Und dann in dem Moment, wenn man die Bitcoin-Adressen verteilt, auf das Papier schreiben, das heutige Datum, zum Beispiel 15. April 2015, plus vier Jahre ist gleich 15.04.2019. Luego vas a explicar a la gente, mira, esta es la llave privada. Tú y yo la tengo, la tienes. Si no quitas, transfieres este dinero de Bitcoin eh, en estos cuatro años, yo lo vuelvo a tener. Tener o sacar. Then you explain to the people, look, this is the private key. I have it and you have it. If you don't take this money, Bitcoin, out of this account, I will take it out in, this, um, in these four years, at the end of these four years. Und dann erklärst du den Leuten, schau, das ist der private Schlüssel. Um, ich und du haben diesen privaten Schlüssel, Bitcoin Schlüssel. Wenn du äh, bis Ende dieser vier Jahre das Geld, Bitcoin, nicht raus tust, transfer, äh, dann hole ich es zurück. De esta forma, das más motivación a la gente para empezar a aprender cómo funciona Bitcoin. This way, you give more motivation to the people to learn how the technology of Bitcoin functions. Auf diese Weise gibst du mehr Motivation den Leuten zu lernen, wie die Technologie von Bitcoin funktioniert. In mi video antigo. So basically, when, uh, when I put in money, I am actually... Uh, creating a new set of private keys and uh, with those new private keys I'm, uh, I'm, I'm putting money into this multi-signature signature address. So it's my own browser that is my own wallet in the background without me even realizing it, right? Yeah, that's right. Thank you. So, uh, so maybe we could, uh, we could talk about one of your other projects that, uh, that, is, that is quite interesting. It's, uh, it's called uh, Decentraland. And it's a project that I that I saw that uh, merges uh, virtual reality and uh, blockchain technology. Now I've been surfing around the virtual reality world for uh, for the past half a year, and you see uh, you see many people talk about the intersection of the blockchain and the virtual reality. There's, there's statements like Bitcoin will be the currency of the metaverse. The metaverse is the virtual reality universe. Or, or you see statements like um, that uh, the virtual reality needs to be decentralized. So could you explain what is, what is the connection between these two technologies and why you chose to devote some of your time to it? Uh, it's actually a super experimental project we did for fun. Uh, so don't expect uh, a lot of sense to come out of this, but uh, we were also really we really excited personally about virtual reality and of course blockchain technology because we work there in the in the industry. 
and we wanted to do a small experiment where we could combine those two cool ideas. Uh, I don't know how much sense that makes, but we wanted to build a blockchain-based virtual reality world. The idea is to, to use the blockchain as the support for the structure of the world. So in Bitcoin, you have the blockchain as a data structure that allows you to synchronize the state of the decentralized network uh, so that all the nodes can agree and reach uh, a consensus on what the, uh, to simplify it, the balance of every Bitcoin address is. Uh, so the same idea could be applied to uh, a network where the nodes uh, synchronize the state of a virtual world. So uh, transactions in this, uh, in this blockchain would be uh, state modifications of the world. So, uh, and in the case of the central land, we did a really simple technical prototype where you have uh, the model of the virtual world is just a pixel grid. So uh, a two-dimensional color grid with, where each pixel can have different colors. And transactions represent a color change in the two-dimensional grid. So one transaction in the central land is uh, 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 a message that changes the color of one pixel at coordinate at, at a, an XY coordinate. And mining uh, is, is used as in Bitcoin to, to validate and provide security to, to, the, to the transactions. And uh, when you generate a new block, the Coinbase transaction in the center line allows you to add a new pixel to the grid. So initially, you have a, a one by one grid, so only one pixel. And when you mine the next block, you can add a new pixel to the grid uh, in an adjacent position. So the idea is that the, the grid of pixels will, will grow over time when users are mining new blocks. And then where the owners of each pixel can change the color. So it's actually a really simple model of a virtual world. It's sort of a proof of concept that has no actual use, but it was a fun experiment to do. So it was like, I could see that it's a prototype, but uh, it could, to my eye, it also, um, it was sort of the answer to one of the problems that, that, that virtual reality has. Um, well, not not an exact answer, but a, but a really interesting one. So, so with virtual reality, I think the the problem is, um, if I actually start to live my life in virtual reality, then I I want to have my own house or my own property in virtual reality, and I want to own own something in virtual reality, like like the way people used to own stuff in in Second Life. But the problem is, if if uh, all of the information to create this virtual space is with a company like Google. And I call something my house in virtual reality, but actually all the information to build it is owned by Google that can go down any, any day, that can prevent me from own, accessing my own house in virtual reality. So uh, a centralized model is like, I, I, I want to own something, but I really can't own anything in a, in a centralized model of, uh, of data processing. So, uh, so the, it seemed to be that with decent land, I could have uh, my ownership over something, and the the data structure that is giving me ownership is not a centralized entity, and that makes it really interesting. Would you would you would you agree with that? Yeah, it, it's exactly what we try to do with the central land. This first version, you could see those pixels as parcels of the world, and you own those parcels, and you get to decide which color uh, you can paint those pixels. But in a further version, that would be your land, your house, instead of a pixel and a color. Also, the motivation for that, like why, why would you want it to be decentralized and actually own it? Uh, we, even, even today, where we have virtual worlds that are super centralized, say, I don't know, uh, games, like World of Warcraft, uh, players spend a lot of time and invest a lot of, of money and time into those virtual worlds. Uh, we think that when you actually own the stuff and you don't have the risk of a company changing the rules of the world or taking ownership of what you built, uh, the, the time and the things we will see created in those virtual worlds uh, will increase a lot. Like the investment of users into virtual worlds will grow a lot because they will actually 
know that there is no risk to lose that uh, to the, the whims of a company. Before we wrap up here, uh, I'd like to briefly uh, talk about proof of existence. So, uh, Manuel, you sort of pioneered this, um, the idea of proof of existence. And it's funny because I was reading, a, a, just randomly reading this white paper this week, and it mentioned you in the abstract as the as the person that pioneered the, the, the sort of idea of the proof of existence in the blockchain. So, you know, proof of existence essentially is... Um, time stamping a piece of data with a hash that you uh, then put into a transaction and uh, in the in the op return and that hash is is sort of notarized into the blockchain forever so that you can prove that at, you know time x uh, this piece of data existed so it could be a document it could be an mp3 file it could be could be a contract whatever and that allows you to notarize a piece of information at a certain point in time. I, I personally find that this is one of the more, most interesting use cases for Bitcoin and blockchain technology outside of payments. And I wanted to get your ideas about uh, what you think about that and um, you know, where do you think this is going? Um, yeah, first, first of all, I, I have to say that I was not the first to think about this. Uh, after building proof of existence, I found that there are several projects doing the same thing, the same idea. Although proof of existence was certainly the, the first user-friendly experience, most were tools for developers where you had to download some com command line utility to do this and running a full node. So it was actually the first uh, user accessible way of doing it. Um, but yeah, it was it is considered by, by many like the first real world application of the blockchain that is non-final, non-financial. Um, and I think it's a, it's a really interesting way to think about the blockchain. Like uh, there, there are a lot of things we can, there are a lot of properties of Bitcoin that can be used for other systems other than payment. And mainly what proof of existence does is using the, the fact that it's a public ledger uh, where you have decentralized consensus on, on data that is published. Um, and that, that the, the blockchain a structure allows to timestamp that data. Uh, so, uh, I, fro I this this project was launched three years ago or so, and since then there have been many many similar projects coming out. Uh, some trying to improve on the technical side, some trying to look, sort of build a nicer product, uh, more targeted to a specific uh, use case. Uh, recently, there, there have been a couple of really interesting developments. Uh, the, the Ethereum project sort of uh, improved uh, both in the technical and the, the business side. They are building a, a system where it's based on an open source uh, project called Chainpoint, where what you do is instead of inserting each document's hash in a single Bitcoin transaction, uh, they, they use a Merkle tree to insert several documents. Uh, so you only insert one hash per each Bitcoin block, which is uh, the, it's a better way to do it because um, with Bitcoin, you only have one timestamp for each block. So it makes no sense to add many documents into the same Bitcoin block. Uh, but they solved it in a really interesting way where they, they can provide you a proof uh, like a a proof where you don't need any of the other documents in the same block to know that your document actually is in the in that Bitcoin block. Uh, so the basic idea is you have a, a set of documents each 10 minutes, and you build a Merkle tree from that, and you insert the root of the tree into a Bitcoin block. And then you give each user a Merkle proof, uh, or, or the, the path in the Merkle tree that proves that your document uh, is part of that Merkle tree. So the user can then use his document and the Merkle proof, or how they call it, I think it's a blockchain receipt or something like that. Uh, with those two pieces of information, you can prove that your document uh, had a certain timestamp in the using the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, that's an interesting project. Um, uh, yeah, I'm... I'm I'm uh, very interesting to see, interested to see where where this goes. 
Are, are you aware of any uh, any instances where uh, a notarization in the blockchain was? Well, I mean, my my question is basically: Is there legal precedence for this to stand up in court or in some sort of a dispute resolution? In, for instance, copyright, because there you know there's other companies like we've talked to. Um, uh, Trent McConaughey of Ascribe, you know, they're doing sort of neurization of digital art on the blockchain. And like you mentioned, there are so many other projects that are doing similar things. I, I, I feel like this might be something that sort of gains somewhat uh, interesting quantities of adoption. Uh, how do you think that, um, how do you think that it would be legally... Uh, will it become legally binding soon, you think? Do you think that it will be adopted as something that you know, people would sort of trust as a, a, a viable way to notarize documents rather than going through like a notary or, or what other you know, copyright registration, things like that? Yeah, so the, there's no legal precedent yet. The only uh, similar case we have is the Canada State uh, Canada Senate that they when they did a uh, cryptocurrency research they uh, they actually uh, used uh, a similar well actually the, the same protocol from proof of existence to to certify their own cryptocurrency report in the blockchain that's the only like uh, government uh, acknowledgement of this technology working but it's we still haven't seen any legal precedent of someone using it in court I think that the the way this could develop is um, someone that used proof of existence or a similar blockchain-based time stamping system uh, going to court about something, and they they will need to have a an expert witness. Like I, I don't know how these are called in English, but uh, the people that go to court and try to explain to the judge. Uh, yeah, an expert something. witness. Yeah. Okay, expert witness. And in that case, we'll we'll see what uh, what precedent is is set and if if it can actually hold in, hold in court or not. Um, but I think that as it works technically, uh, it it only needs time so that people sort of understand it and see the the value and sort of uh, er, er, these kind of things need time. So it's it's a matter of and and as you said, with all these companies uh, emerging and doing work. Uh, in this area, I think it's it's better even. Uh, but we we still need to see what happens in in court. The technology is solid though, and when we asked uh, some lawyers in Argentina, they said that this could pretty easily hold uh, an investigation, and it could actually be could be held correctly against the judge which actually surprised me because I, I, I thought that it will, there would be no chance that a judge would take something like this into his trials. Yeah, maybe we need a good, uh, we need a big, big uh, case where it's like a hundred million dollars on stake and the proof is on the Bitcoin blockchain <laughs> and then, uh, and then the judges agree on it and then that, that, really drives this kind of thing mainstream it's pretty similar to what what happened in uh, in biology like people were shouting that can you patent life uh, for 20 years and then there's there's one guy who actually did patent it and then there was a huge case for 50 50 million dollars and after that suddenly this uh, this idea of uh, patenting genes went into the mainstream maybe 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 bitcoin will be similar it needs this big lawsuit moment where some big parties are suing each other and the only proof is the Bitcoin blockchain. Well, what I find really interesting about the sort of service like proof of existence or some other services out there is that it, it I find that it opens up the business model. The, the business model is not necessarily reliant on Bitcoin payments. So a service like proof of existence or the others that you mentioned, Tyrion uh, and, and services like this can charge per notarization uh, with a credit card or whatever. So it, it allows people from outside of the Bitcoin and blockchain space to use the blockchain for something actually pretty useful, which is notarizing documents. 
Yeah, that's true. And I, I think that it, that's a really big uh, strength for a Bitcoin business right now or a blockchain-based business because user adoption is, is growing pretty slow. So if you, if you are basing your product on, on the assumption that your users will have Bitcoin, you, really, you, re, you need a really, really compelling use case so that you get users to actually buy Bitcoin to use your application. Uh, in, in other case, you need to have an application where Bitcoin is invisible. And you, as you said, you can have credit card or PayPal payments and still uh, use the blockchain in some other way where it's invisible to the user. So before we wrap up, um, we just want to mention briefly, so you guys have a new company. Can you just tell us briefly about the company and what you're trying to achieve? Yeah, we just started a new company. It's called Smart Contract Solutions. Uh, we're, we're doing work with smart contracts. Uh, we're currently in stealth mode, so we cannot talk about the details, but uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll have something we can talk publicly about soon. <laughs> Okay, great. Well, um, I want to thank you both for coming on today. It was a really interesting discussion. I, I think that, you know, this problem, I mean, problem, the issue of content monetization is one that, I mean, there's definitely, uh, the, you know, Bitcoin definitely tries to solve it in some way. Now, whether or not it will catch, uh, it'll catch on because of user adoption of Bitcoin or, you know, as, as we mentioned, the user experience problem that needs to be solved is still remains to be to be seen. But in any case, I think that it does provide a really interesting way for content providers to uh, to monetize their content. Yeah, definitely. We are also very eager to see solutions in that space. Uh, content monetization, Streamium, Faradam, proof of existence. They all there is something from that into all this. Okay, well, thanks for coming on. Uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, to our listeners, thank you for, for joining us today on another episode of Epicenter Bitcoin. We release new episodes every Monday. Uh, you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, SoundCloud, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. It could be also on, the, uh, on iOS or Android. And you can also watch the video version of the show uh, on YouTube at youtube.com slash Epicenter Bitcoin. Of course, you can always send us a tip and the tipping address will be in the show notes. Now, just as a quick note, Regarding the t-shirt bribing uh, operation that we had going on uh, for these last few weeks, we've actually run out of t-shirts. So um, you can still leave us a review on iTunes and uh, you can send us an email at show at epicenterbitcoin.com to let us know that you've uh, sent us a review. Unfortunately, we won't be able to send you the t-shirt right away. We're getting some new ones made uh, as quickly as we can. And as soon as we have some new ones, we'll be shipping those out to, uh, to our listeners. And for those of you who have uh, received a t-shirt, uh, we would be super uh, grateful if you could take a picture of yourself with the t-shirt and send it to us. And we'd like to post that on social media. Uh, so thanks so much. And we look forward to being back next week.